Welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, the creator and founder of Genetic Insights and Feel Younger, Elwin Robinson. And today we are carrying on with your questions and our answers. So here we go, kicking off, starting with the first question. And we have one more from Patricia McCartney, 9779. Excellent breakdown. Finally understand the puzzle more. That's really great. That's, you know, part of what we do here. I know like a lot of the things that you go into, Elwin, especially on detoxification in the liver, it's like, ah, to see it broken down that way because it's not just as simple as yeah okay go detox like there are certain processes and certain steps and they need to be there in you know aligned up so that your body can do that especially you know when we're trying to optimize or especially you know maturing instead of aging disgracefully you know it's doing the process really well so yeah so you know that's very true you know understanding more pieces of the puzzle it's very very helpful and they're hard-won insights. I didn't, uh, you know, go to a college and pay to get them. I suffered my way to realizing them in general. <laughs> well, thank you for your suffering. <laughs> it's much appreciated, and hopefully it's a lot less now. <laughs> this is from uh, JR3213. Have read that bloodletting also reduces microplastics. Uh, yeah, I... R- Bloodletting will uh, reduce every blood-borne toxin by definition, right? If you're <laughs> removing some of the blood, you're going to remove all the toxins along with it. Uh, but it's a good point about the microplastics. I think they're saying that because it's very hard to detoxify microplastics. So Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, that, is there a way? I mean, I think we might have touched on this previously. But well, that's like, definitely mm. going to be one. But yeah, that might be one of the uh, the only ones, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and as you've talked about previously, it's to try and try and limit it as much as you can of taking that in, so that your body isn't um, ingesting it. Wooden chopping boards is one uh, tip for that. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. Uh, next, it comes from Yumi eight sixteen. Can you please elaborate on caffeine? Is or on the caffeine? Is this okay during pregnancy? Because Weston Price Foundation is adamantly against any caffeine. Studies also show even fifty to two hundred milligrams caffeine causes lower birth weight. I'm ad- adamantly against any caffeine, I'll be honest. Now, it's always dependent on context, right? I'm not saying that to be diplomatic. You know, I'm not very diplomatic, yeah. Chrissy. I'm saying it's no. true. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, because no, in a lot of places that you look, there are things that say it's good. There are things that say it's bad, you know? And so it's like, ah, oh, trying to find the truth of it in this day and age is very, very difficult. There's a lot of confusing things out there. So I would say the studies that generally say that it's good are looking at short-term results. And so again, I would treat coffee as a medicine rather than a food. That would be the correct way of looking at it. So, uh, you know, I know Ray P was a huge fan of it. And I mention him a lot because I know a lot of people who listen to this uh, are fans of Ray P. So I want to, you know, give give credit where credit is due. Um, he was a big fan of it. He considered, it, you know, one of the best substances ever. And he cited a lot of studies talking about the benefits of it. Most of those studies are fairly short term, though. Um, We have to understand that one of the main mechanisms whereby it works is by reducing what they call an inhibitory uh, neurochemical called adenosine. Adenosine is an inhibitory chemical that builds up slowly from the moment we wake up throughout the day until nighttime, at which time it makes us feel sleepy. Now, you know what else is an inhibitory neurochemical? GABA. So when they say inhibitory, what they actually mean is calming or relaxing. And so what it does is it inhibits a relaxing and calming neurochemical. So if you remove the thing that relaxes and calms you, you're left with stimulation. And so that's what it does. And that's why it increases metabolism, increases heart rate, it definitely increases adrenaline. Is that a good thing or not? Short term, maybe, right? There are benefits to increasing cortisol and adrenaline short term. Wim Hof method is an example of something beneficial for a lot of people anyway that does that. Um, Intense heat, you know, sauna, uh, steam, stuff like that. Beneficial, that increases stress chemicals. Exercise, intense exercise, increases stress chemicals. Uh, Holding a breath for long periods of time, things like buteco breathing, increases stress chemicals. All of these things have been shown to have a lot of health benefits. The problem is when either the organism is too fragile to be able to handle that or when it's overdone. And so, and I think it does depend a lot where the person is. If a person's kind of sluggish, then, and when I say sluggish, I mean like they move quite slowly. Um, It's 
quite difficult to overstimulate them, then caffeine is a lot safer. When a person is the other way around, when they're easily overwhelmed, but exhausted, which is another common type, I think it's disastrous because it's just going to increase the adrenaline even more. It's going to leave them uh, thereby reducing the testosterone, reducing the progesterone, uh, more, you know, causing insulin resistance. All of these other problems can start with adrenaline dominance, as Michael Platt talks about. So I would um, be very careful with caffeine unless you're either very strong. So, you know, a lot of the studies talking about the benefits are done with like athletes and stuff showing that it increases performance. That's true. So for performance, it can be beneficial. I've said this for years as well, even, you know, before I guess my understanding was a bit more nuanced. I was aware of this much, which is if you're driving late at night and you're starting to fall asleep at the wheel, pull over and get a coffee <laughs> because <laughs> coffee is definitely less dangerous than you falling know, free, asleep at the wheel free exactly. car pile up on the motorway yeah <laughs> yes. so you've got to be realistic about these things as well um <laughs> but just because it could it, you know it could save your life but it, that doesn't mean it's good to have every day and i think that's really the problem where people are used to having it every day most people as i said there's a small subsection of people who for whatever reason their metabolism the speed at which they move is very slow and the uh, and when I say speed at which they move, I don't only mean literally. I mean the speed at which their mind moves. I mean the speed at which a lot of their enzymes are moving and processing and doing chemical reactions. All of that is speeded up by coffee and caffeine, uh, and so it's um, can be beneficial for some type of people. The kind of kapha, K A P H A metabolism from uh, Ayurveda, like that kind of person is the most likely to benefit from it. But generally, the people who are most drawn to it are the vata types the ones who are already uh, on edge and wiry and and uh stressed and overwhelmed and therefore exhausted and then they're having caffeine to kind of push them to get through another day and um it's just leaving you more and more depleted ultimately unfortunately and the other part that they were saying is is it okay to um have during pregnancy um and i think we discussed that earlier but yeah 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 no i mean anything's okay you, you can drink arsenic during you know it's, it's a question but is it optimal no i would i would not say so definitely not uh, next question is coming from marquez kw thanks for taking on this gigantic amount of work i so enjoy it and i am grateful i would like to request a topic hormone testing please i like so many have had to become my own expert and finally at 36 would like to get some hormonal testing done instead of going exclusively by feel i just wouldn't even know where to start or know what's worth its salt thanks mm, great question well we've really covered this to some degree Thyroid is probably the most important hormone to test in most cases. Now, I'm not saying you should only do that one, but I'm saying that is the one I would start with. Um, and so we've really done an episode on that. Uh, in terms of um, the other ones, we're going to do episodes on that soon with Dr. Miriam. You're going to do one, Chrissy, with uh, her on female hormones. This is planned anyway. Um, and I... Um, Maybe we'll do one with just you and me and male hormones because I think she acknowledges she's not the um, the uh, expert on that and I understand that one a lot better. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll do that. But we've really done quite a lot on that subject, I would say, but it's kind of scattered around a bit. So I agree with this person. It would be good to do a concise, just focused on that episode. We'll do one for women and one for men. Uh, but as I said, thyroid is super important for both and I would start there and that episode's already out. And our next question comes from Ash Island, eighty sixty one. But all the best foods that f that uh, sorry, yeah, all the best foods that are full of different beneficial vitamins also contain vitamin A, such as eggs and liver. How can we source those nutrients while avoiding vitamin A? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a tricky one. Uh, choline is especially a good example of what this person is saying. A good argument for what this person is saying. Um, Choline is not considered an essential nutrient because your body can make its own. But some people who have a variant of the PEMG gene, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, I know. I'm, my, my report's like, need more choline, more choline, so. Yeah, yeah. a lot of people I uh, meet uh, and see uh, have that issue. And I think it is like a root cause that then leads to a lot of detoxification issues later on because it causes cholestasis if there's chronically not enough choline. So this is a really good point. And I think... 
if supplementation didn't exist or if it's not available to you, it's a good argument for having at least eggs. I would say eggs would be much more justifiable rather than liver um, because while liver has, you know, some things which arguably may or may not be innately a toxin like vitamin A and I know uh, copper is another one that Dr. Smith considers innately a toxin. Um, Liver definitely has high levels of all kinds of other stuff that's definitely bad for you, like cadmium and lead and uh, mercury and all the rest of it. Whereas egg yolks do not necessarily. Egg yolks do have fairly high levels of uh, omega-6s, so that's also not great, which is why I really you know, would prefer supplementation for choline specifically. Um, I actually would struggle to think of any other nutrient other than choline, which you would not be able to get from another food other than liver and egg yolks if the person can this person or anyone else can point out to me anything that i'm missing uh, which you couldn't get from you know heart muscle meat various forms of dairy egg white even then i'm all ears but i believe that choline is the the only one that you really struggle to get if you're not having those two foods as i said if you don't want to supplement i'll go for egg yolks yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I, I know, you know, looking further into the vitamin A and like limiting the foods and stuff, it's like, oh, okay. Or it's really kind of like, mm, <laughs> not a lot. <laughs> but, you know, you make a really valid point, excellent point that we're, you know, just moving towards a supplementation to help make sure that you are getting those things that you are looking for in those foods that potentially have those higher, higher levels of vitamin A. Yeah, if you go for no vitamin A, then there's not a lot of foods. But if you're just avoiding the highest sources, because otherwise you're fine, then you're really talking about avoiding liver and most organ meats other than heart. And you're talking about avoiding uh, like the dark leafy greens. And you're talking about avoiding like orange root vegetables. That's pretty much it. You can still, I know dairy is frowned upon in that community, but it's really not super high compared to any of those things that I just said. And a lot of the other things that some of those communities don't recommend, like sulfurous foods or you know, tomatoes, whatever, none of those technically really have significant amount of carotenoids. They're just not recommended for other reasons. So if you're only just avoiding high vitamin A, let, let's say because you're that person who had the Accutane poisoning, it's really only a few things you're avoiding. You're avoiding, like I said, organ meats, except for heart, and you're avoiding um, uh, uh, dark leafy greens and orange roots. You, I would say you could still have dairy and you could still have egg yolks, and it's, it's not an insane amount in those as long as you don't overdo it. Good point. Good point. Uh, we've got uh, Daniel Murray coming in 2529 saying, great stuff. Don't know of any other health related podcast covering topics like these. Thank you. Um, TMCMIZ1005. This channel is a gold mine. Thanks for this. Um, Udo Ketza, very helpful information. And CZE. K-I-T-O. That's absolutely the most informative podcast I've ever heard. It's almost unbelievable that you guys are doing it for free. Thanks. Um, so a few of those. And then we've got, uh, yeah, Daniel Murray again coming in. Uh, hi, Ellen. Wondering about your thoughts on Toxaprevent. Have you ever tried it? Supposed to be a specific form of zeolite. I usually like to avoid zeolites due to aluminum concerns, but would appreciate your take on this one as another toxicity binder with activated charcoal. Thanks. I've tried it. I spoke to the, the guys at that company as well. Um, it just didn't make any difference to my levels. Uh, of the when you were testing yeah. to see. Okay. So I would not consider it to be something that significant. Um, I'm not against it either. It didn't suddenly give me high levels of anything bad either. But yeah, I've just, I've not found much success with uh, zeolite. And I, I, the, the studies are also unconvincing to me. Uh, you know, the things that are convincing are DMSA, EDTA, uh, activated charcoal, uh, modified citrus pectin, maybe I've missed one or two, uh, bentonite clay, but zeolite doesn't really have, seem to have any benefit at least over bentonite clay, which is a hell of a lot cheaper, so. Okay, great. Next question, Sullivan Kelly, 85. Hello, Sullivan, again. Do you think the Buddha was an endurer? <laughs> I remember That's this a question. great question. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I can understand. I love questions like because it shows that he was obviously paying attention and understood what we were talking about. So this is about the episode where we talk about the uh, the five uh, character um, 
or, or what do we call them survival the personality yeah, yeah 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 um yeah. survival strategies from uh, um uh, Wilhelm Reich and Alexander Lowen, and then most recently uh, Stephen Kessler. And to answer the question, just answer the question. Yes, I can see why he's saying that because the all life is suffering kind of perspective. Um, I would say Buddha, but uh, you know, it, first of all, because he's a leader, all leaders are aggressive to some degree. Like I talked about, include including all spiritual leaders. However, of all the spiritual leaders, you could say he was actually the least aggressive because he he was still aggressive in the sense of he went his own way against the grain because, as I believe, the story is his father wanted him to be like a king or, you know, like a ruler, and he rejected that life to, you know, live a life of peace and meditation and, and spirituality. Um, so that's kind of anti-aggressive in one way, but still doing the exact opposite of what a whole nation wanted you to do is also quite still disagreeable and aggressive. Um, but yeah, like other than that, certainly the philosophy of all life is suffering uh, does sound pretty endure. But if you actually look at the picture of him, he's the most um, oral or merging looking of all of them. With For the, the big, body type, the shape. Yeah. yeah, and body type is a big part of uh, that particular system. So he does look like a um, uh, like an oral or merging type. Also the philosophy, so there's the all life is suffering, but then the next sentence I believe is, and craving or desire is the root of that suffering. And so that kind of reminds me of the merging type, where the key thing about the merging type is that they have this uh, black hole inside of themselves that they feel can never be filled and so because of that they're constantly engaged in compulsive um, behavior to try and fill that void inside themselves so you know seeking desire craving all of that kind of stuff that the buddha warns against so um, i would say probably a combination of those uh, i would say he would have to have been aggressive to as i said go against the grain to such a great degree and you know, have the, um, what's the word, the initiative to create a whole new spiritual system. Uh, but the philosophy he teaches is uh, quite appealing to the endurer type and then almost kind of resolving the fundamental struggle of the emerging type. And not only because of what I just said, but also what's the ultimate goal of the Buddhist system? The ultimate goal is... And again, I'm sorry if I butcher this, but some of the central tenets are to reach nirvana, which is a, uh, a, u uh, a unification with all, uh, a merging back into the all, which, you know, merging. Um, and then also a teaching of compassion. And again, compassion is very much a virtue that is prized above all else by the merging types, as well as to some degree about the endurer. But the endurer is kind of... They want other people to be compassionate, <laughs> whereas uh, the merging types really are compassionate and they can't understand how anyone else could be not compassionate. They're very confused by cold-hearted people um, or aggressive people. So, yeah, I would say, yeah, it's that. It's uh, a person who would have to be aggressive in order to get their philosophy out there that is appealing very much to endurers, but fundamentally is resolving the great merging challenge and we all have that merging challenge to one de to one degree or another it's quite unusual that people have zero of that merging uh because it's quite unusual that people have a hundred percent of their needs met throughout their childhood and no, absolutely and and everybody's a little bit of something of those five correct everyone's There's got a different little degrees bit. yeah yeah the point that stephen kessler makes is it's your go-to strategy which really defines you you can't have like five simultaneous strategies and also it's very rare that people are fluid enough to, you know, have five different strategies depending on the situation. Most people have like a go-to strategy. Some people if they're challenged will hide, some people will get angry, some people will feel sorry for themselves. Like there's this kind of, um, what's the word? Uh, um, automatic patterns that people follow. But yeah, uh, even though it may not be one of your automatic patterns. Everyone does that sometimes. And so the merging one is really reaching out for help. And there's very few people who never have that pattern, right? Everyone does it sometimes when it's not appropriate. And obviously, if you're doing it when it's appropriate, then it's not necessarily a pattern. It's simply an intelligent 
what you know rational thing to do but some people you know uh, do it everyone does it at least sometimes when perhaps they shouldn't be doing that right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. absolutely yeah for sure that's a great question um we've got ash island 8061 again so how is accutane effective against acne if vitamin a is so harmful I think we answered that earlier, really, yeah. with the ca- carrot oil and all the rest of it. Yeah, because you mentioned like it's a peel, so it's going to take off that layer. It's going to reveal things underneath. But uh, you know, unfortunately, that product that you're using is, is so toxic that you're then having detrimental effects from it. And toxic, I, I'm not disagreeing, but I think a more precise term would be caustic, right? It's caustic, literally yeah. burning away those few layers. Uh, for a much better and more detailed explanation than I've given you, uh, Poisoned for Profits by Grant Gennaro. He's got about 30, 40 pages of his book dedicated to answering that question. Well, let me ask you this then, and I think we have touched this on another episode, but I just can't remember. So if somebody does have acne, you know, what would their solution be, you know, be, you know, so they're not going down that route with the Accutane or some other kind of product? So all Accutane is doing is drying that the... Uh, pores up so that and this person you know talks about experiencing that dryness and it you know dries up the eyes the sinus passages the gastrointestinal tract all the rest of it and it dries up the skin um so that is not resolving anything other than how you look but the the reason for the acne in the first place is because your body is pushing out toxicity there may be other factors involved there may be some kind of uh, organism on the skin which is irritating it and then your immune system is overreacting to it that, that may be going on um, you know one of the pieces of advice that I think is good for people with acne is to uh, stop touching their faces frequently and if they do touch their face uh, make sure to wash their hands first because you know the hands are generally the most dirty part of your body and then if you're touching your face then you are you know contaminating it and, ir- and irritating it of course the skin in your face should be able to handle quite a lot of dirt, but it's, if it's already irritated, then it can just uh, aggravate your immune system more to have more dirt. But I think the fundamental issue is the toxicity. Um, and again, that's not to say if you have acne, then you're toxic, and if you don't, you don't. The body has different strategies for pushing toxins out. From an Eastern perspective, they actually consider if you have skin issues, it's a sign of a relative level of, that you're still quite healthy and vital because your body is pushing the toxins out through the most um, uh, safe and Easiest harmless. pathway, yeah. potentially, yeah. Safe, harmless, and also I think the, the most external pathway. Um, like it doesn't have to be dealt with by the, the inner organs like the liver and the kidneys. So it's not necessarily a sign that there's something bad, but it is a sign that there's something terrible going on with you, but it is a sign that there's something toxic within you. I personally, if it were me and I had acne, other than do all the kind of normal advice of just being healthier in general and listening to our detox episodes and following that and all the rest of it, if you just want a quick tip, I would personally do a bentonite clay poultice. I would get bentonite clay, mix it with water, apply it to the skin wherever there is acne, um, leave it until it dries, wash it off again, and it will dry the skin as well. It will pull everything out of the skin, including the oils. So then maybe put some kind of oil back on there, some kind of uh, oil that you're happy to have on your face. Uh, that would be what I would do. That's like a next level, just pulling the toxicity out. If you do that every day um, for a few weeks, it should resolve the issue. Or if not completely resolved, it should look, you know, 80, 90% better. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. There's... um other other avenues and if you do have questions please let us know and if you've tried that and had your experience share with us so we can share that with everyone too uh next question comes from i yeah i'm gonna get it wrong (laughs) yeah uh n-a-n-o-s-h-a-t-e just because i'm not going to know where the split is and how to pronounce it so thanks for the question comes in saying i was advised that mot c breaks down immediately when in backwater and must be taken within 30 minutes. Any thoughts? Yeah, that's not true. That's like a myth. Um, It was started by someone. It might be Ben Greenfield or he might have just popularized it. I'm not sure. Probably more likely the latter. Uh, I like Ben Greenfield, by the way. He was one of the people who first let people be aware of peptides. He's great. But that particular piece of information, uh, I think, is spurious. It's not based on anything. I remember hearing an interview of... um, the head of the one of the peptide companies I do like being asked that question, he explained in quite a lot of detail why it's nonsense. Uh, and from my personal experience, 
I have found no difference in the effect of it. Even, forget 30 minutes, I leave it in the fridge sometimes for months. It's still completely fine. I don't think there's any issue. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not going to be very quite viable if it's going to break down within 30 minutes. It's like it'd have to be, you know, there's no, it's not stable at all. No, it, it's just not true. I think it's, uh, it's just a myth. I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it, I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have from most articles. So, to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code RejuvenateMe for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code RejuvenateMe at feelyounger.net. All right, and we still have quite a list of questions to get through, so we're going to try rapid fire. I'm not going to be reading out the person's name. I'm just going to try and get through the question very fast, and let's see how quickly and uh, swiftly you can answer these. So here we go. Getting fatigued easily, getting cold easily, and feeling anxious could also be caused by not having enough of the right nutrients minerals. Is the underarm thermometer test an indicator of being hypothyroid, or can I cross myself off the hypothyroid list because I'm thin and never gain weight? If not, it sounds like the plan is to test your mineral and vitamin levels first, get them where they need to be, and then find a good doctor to test for hypothyroid. Yeah, a, all right, there's a few questions in there. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll, I'll answer the last bit first. What you just said is a strategy, and that's a strategy for someone who doesn't want to go to a doctor and get thyroid supplementation, which is perfectly reasonable. A lot of people are wary about hormone supplementation. Um, so yeah, if, if you want to do it that way, great. If you want to feel better as quickly as possible, I would go to a hormone doctor first, and then work out the underlying toxic and or nutritional deficiency that may be causing it. Um, but if you want to work out the underlying issues first, then go to a doctor, that's fine as well. Um, the underarm test is to measure your metabolism uh, based on your heat based on your body heat, the basal metabolic rate as indicated by your basal temperature. And so thyroid function is the thing that controls that basal metabolism. So you're measuring your temperature uh, as an indicator of how your thyroid is doing. Some people still believe that it's actually the best indicator and that it's superior to blood tests. I am of that um, opinion personally as well, based on having read both sides and heard both sides and now actually doing a lot of practical application and seeing that really the temperature is the the most reliable indicator wonderful uh where do you buy selac or and cmax i go to cosmic Tr nootropic uh cosmic nootropic.com uh use code rejuvenate for 10 percent off the bit about progesterone treatment and smarter babies made me very interested in knowing if I'm able to take some progesterone supplement while pregnant and if that is safe slash affects baby well. Any info I can go to find out more about it? Yes, as far as I understand, it is very safe. Um, the levels of progesterone that naturally exist inside a woman or should naturally exist inside a woman during pregnancy are so high that even masses amounts of supplementation doesn't affect it significantly. So from my understanding, it's completely safe. Anecdotally, one of the people I experienced with very closely, I will not give any identifiers because of what I'm about to say, um, but that who I have worked with closely said that uh, a couple of her children, she took progesterone while they were pregnant and a couple, uh, one of the children, she did not. The, ch the child where she took the children where she took progesterone when she was pregnant uh, were probably 20 IQ points higher. So that <laughs> assertion from Ray Pete uh, was certainly true in her case. And I don't think there was any placebo involved there because she hadn't even heard of that. She was only taking it because a professional told her to. So uh, yeah, anecdotally, I, I think it is completely fine. According to all the studies, I think it's completely fine. According to some of the medical professionals I've spoken to, it's completely fine. But of course, check it with a doctor. How confident are you in the accuracy of the genetic testing? I've heard a lot of world-class experts doubt their validity. 100% uh, accurate. Uh, to doubt is fine. I'm uh, sorry, 100% confident. To doubt is fine. I'm very um, open to doubt and skepticism. 
uh, and to express doubt even is fine. I've done it myself. I've doubted things. I might end up being wrong. That's totally fine. Um, but when you actually go through the experience yourself, and when I say the experience, I mean with a system like ours that's actually accurate, I realize there are other systems out there that are not accurate. And of course, if those world-class experts have been through those other people's systems and then they have doubts as to how accurate it is, then of course they're right. Those systems aren't accurate, but ours is. And I think we've provided a few examples of that. The recent yeah, episode the genetic, we did, genetic where, nutrients, where we check talked that about out. nutrients was an example yeah. about it. Um, I haven't done the equivalent of that with hormones yet, but that's another great one that I'm considering because there's so many times where... Uh, I do. I go through consults with people, and it says that they have these tendencies of their hormones. And then, when you look at their test results, their hormones are exactly where their genetics would indicate they would be. It's way, 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 way beyond coincidence. With other things, of course, like you know, different diseases or anxiety, it's all a little bit more subjective because it's not just a simple lab marker like a nutrient or a hormone. Uh, but still, I find it to be uh, extremely accurate and reliable. Otherwise, I wouldn't have dedicated my life to it. It is, is it important that the progesterone cream be liposomal or not important? Liposomal is more expensive. No. In fact, I've never even seen it. Uh, I'm sure it's fine, but uh, blood levels increase very reliably with normal transdermal progesterone. Another question. I know it might be troublesome, but can you specify ratio of vitamin K and D? Supplements on the shelf can have uh, like 100 UG of K2, 4,000 UI of D3. Would you say that this is a proper ratio? Or maybe one should aim for 300 UG of K2 to 1,000 UI of D3. Thanks. I'm thinking about a healthy person situation that aims to prevent. I would say good default is our supplement on Feel Younger. Uh, of D3 to K2. Now you've heard maybe the episode of Dr. Garrett Smith where he doubts any uh, benefit of vitamin D3 supplementation. I'm not convinced on that one yet, although I'm open to it. Uh, but th there is a lot of evidence about D3 being beneficial. I see less evidence about it being uh, detrimental, except in excess. And in excess, it absolutely is terrible, as I know from personal experience and as there is an abundance of uh, research indicating. So really... There is no default. I, I think the Feel Younger is pretty good because the levels are quite low of D3, so it's in the safe range. But still, the best thing to do is to test. I would actually, if it's supplemental D3, I would actually want the person to be on the lower end of the reference range. I know that's opposite of what everyone says, but it's kind of the compromise between Dr. Smith's position of it's totally bad, you shouldn't have it at all, versus the cut. And to be honest, even a lot of medical doctors uh, up until recently were of that opinion that it's not a good idea to supplement it. That's completely changed now, of course. Um, and then the other opinion, which is that you should have it at the high end of the reference range, which is becoming much more common and you know, certainly in the functional medicine community, something like that. So for me, uh, lowish end of the reference range if you're getting it from supplements and then as high as you want if you're getting it from the sun. Um, and really you've got to base it on that. You've got to base it on your actual levels and not what me or anyone else says. Other than that, if you just want a default supplement, as I said, ours is pretty good because it's kind of modest quantity of uh, both. Wonderful. Yeah, check that out, that Dr. Garrett episode for sure. Uh, Elwin, what is your opinion on his recommendation of orange juice? I guess that's Ray P. Um, I have, uh, I, I don't know, I haven't even tested it, but I used to have an issue of orange. I used to have kind of like an intolerance reacting to it. I never really enjoyed it anyway, which is why I haven't tested it to see if I still have it. Um, I do see the benefits though. Uh, I know the flavonoids are pretty awesome. So the sugar, the fructose, it depends on the person. If, if it is good for you, then great. But just because Ray Pete thought it was good and... Just because there's a list of its benefits. That's true of everything. And it's true for everything that I just said that I eat as well, right? If it doesn't agree with you, then it doesn't agree with you. But I do not think it's innately bad. If it agrees with you, yes, it's got some decent benefits. Is taking an iron bisglycinate supplement the same as taking an iron ferritin supplement? Or is there another type that it may be better to try? I've got Zemvelo. Yeah, I know what I mean by Zenvelo. That's the angstrom-sized nanoparticles of iron. Um, I, I talked about this recently. I think the only type of iron which works in some cases is the genuine heme iron. I had someone in the comments actually recently say they used a heme iron supplement and it was really effective. And I was skeptical about that because most 
supplements that say they're heme iron are actually not. But when I looked into it, Chrissy, you might be interested in this one. Uh, I asked them what they were using and they, they uh, uh, gave me a link. And it actually is just a supplement, which is an extract from spleen, which is uh, the very thing that I recommended to you. So it's literally a spleen organ extract, but just with the uh, standardized to a certain amount of heme iron. So that's probably like the ideal form of iron supplement, I have to admit, even though we don't sell it, that would be the one that I would consider to be the most reliable and likely to work. I prefer that even over just the spleen uh uh, glandulars that you've been taking Chrissy because it's uh, it's standardized to a certain level of iron so there's less of whatever toxins are in the spleen more of just the heme iron so that's pretty cool yeah that is cool you might have to look at that uh is it fine to get tyrosine from a collagen protein powder supplement or is it better to get a single l-tyrosine supplement there is hardly any tyrosine in a collagen supplement as much as I'm a fan of them so yeah a single supplement definitely is it best to find a local thyroid doctor or is it possible to have an online phone doctor that would be able to diagnose the thyroid properly? Not only is it possible to have an online one, but it's 99% chance that's all you're going to be able to get because there aren't that many of them. Uh, so you'd be lucky to have one locally. Obviously, you know, if you're in a major city like you are, Chrissy, you probably could find one locally. But for the vast majority of us, yeah, online is the only option. And because those people know that, usually they cater for online. This is very interesting. There's just one thing I cannot reconcile. If vitamin A is so toxic, why is there approximately equivalent amounts of it in human breast milk as in cow milk? As we We've talked already about answered this. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, because and... the human, just to repeat in case uh, people are skipping around, because the uh, uh, because breast milk is not uh, has not had everything negative filtered out of it, that's why they also so don't drink alcohol before you breastfeed. Next question. I would love to hear your thoughts on fascia. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I would love to give them. I give them a little bit in the chronic pain episodes. Uh, I do think fascia is super important. Um, and I would like to dedicate a whole episode to fascia. I'm not sure if it will be me or whether we'll have a guest on who's an expert on it. We'll wait and see on that. Yeah, that's a big, big, big thing. Fascia for sure. Um, okay, here we go. Isn't breast milk high in vitamin A? Why would that be if it's a toxin? Well, as we just discussed, yeah. <laughs> I'll just add, because of the way that question's phrased, I'll just add one comment to that is because the way things are is not uh, perfectly made by God to be perfect. Uh, I actually, you know, am religious, but Nonetheless, we have to admit that not everything in the world, we are not living in the Garden of Eden, let's put it that way. So whether you believe in science and evolution and random chance, or whether you believe in, you know, God created the earth in seven days, either way, we're not in the Garden of Eden, things are not perfect. And so <laughs> some things are not great. And uh, poisons getting into breast milk is one of those things that's just not great. That's part of our fallen state and or part of our randomly evolved world. What are your thoughts on avocado, olives, and their oils, and how can PUFAs be removed? I am a fan of those as a compromise. Uh, as I mentioned earlier when I talked about my diet, none of these are a staple in my diet. Uh, but if I were to, say if I couldn't get coconut oil crisps and I wanted a crisp, it would be uh, or, uh, avocado oil or olive oil, otherwise I probably wouldn't eat it. Um, a palm oil is kind of okay as well. Um, how can you remove it? You you can't, you can get high oleic versions of some oils, like high oleic sunflower oil that actually has less uh, polyunsaturated fats even than uh, some of the commonly thought of as saturated fats, like um, maybe not coconut oil, but uh, butter or something like that. Anyway, but unless it is one of those special types that's high oleic, you, you can't, you can't do anything about it. You can't remove it. Exercise in a bottle is what they called car carterine, and that causes cancer. Messing with the mitochondria seems risky, no? I remember that one. That's a comment uh, about Mot C because that was quite a popular video that we called Exercise in the Bottle. Um, I disagree about that characterization of carterine. I, I said this is going to be rap rapid fire. I don't use it personally, but I have done. The evidence, the reason why they abandoned carterine, despite it being so beneficial, is going to be for one or two reasons. Either because it was so beneficial, like it reduced all the lipids, which are, um, you know, major predictors of cardiovascular disease, for instance, among many, many other benefits. Um, they got to a stage, so either they pulled it because it was too beneficial. If you are conspiratorial enough, you might believe that. As you, let's assume you're not conspiratorial. The 
mainstream position as to why they pulled it is because they gave it to rats and they developed all kinds of different types of cancer. Ah, terrible, let's stop. But the thing that they don't mention is they gave it to a type of rat that always gets cancer. So the reason why they give it to that rat is not to see if it will cause cancer, but to see what type of cancer it will cause. And what happened is it produced all kinds of cancers. It, it, it had not just one type, it had a bunch of different types. And so because of that, they were like, oh my God, they freaked out, let's abandon it. But here's the thing. If you were to give a rat who had that predisposition a high dose of growth hormone, I would suspect that the same thing would happen. That doesn't necessarily mean that growth hormone is innately bad, that just means that it stimulates growth. And so I suspect that it's something similar for carterine, that it is not actually innately bad. So I haven't done a video on carterine, I might do it at some point, but I'm not 100% convinced it's bad, and I, you know, nor am I about MOTC. Right, yeah, so deeper, something to look deeper into for sure. Um, anyone know of a high quality desiccated thyroid? Uh, armor is the most reliable one in terms of uh, making sure that it has a standardized level of T3 and T4, which is really what you're looking for. I know there are other people pushing other types, like a bovine type, and I would prefer to get it from a bovine type, but the problem is it's not standardized to a certain level of T3 and T4, any of the ones that I've seen, which means it's a crapshoot. Basically, it's, it's a guess as to what kind of dose you're getting. And as we talked about earlier, T3 and T4 are not like progesterone where you know there's this big range that you're totally fine within. It's something that you want to get it you want to get the right dose and you want to get that dose every day. So yeah, Armour is really the only one that I feel confident recommending having used it. Can it effectively be taken orally, sublingually? How is it usually taken? For example, some peptides are taken for a 10 to 20 day cycle and then halted for six months. So this was the thymosin alpha one peptide ultimate immune system support episode. Just really whenever you use it, I haven't seen any evidence that too much is a problem. Uh, it's really expensive, so basically as much as you can afford to take, and so therefore you would really only take it when you want to boost your immune system. Great clarification. Uh, do thyroid supplements require a prescription? Pretty much every country in the world. Now, you can buy things for research purposes currently still in my country, in your country, Chrissy, um, and so they can be sold as research chemicals, but... The, most research chemicals, including peptides, are harder to get. Well, dosing, I mean, yeah, you're still relying, obviously, on the company you're getting it from, just like any other research chemical. But you can you can buy them, uh, you could buy armor thyroid, for instance, from companies who sell it as research-based, research, uh, research based, basically. Uh, but yeah, there's a dosing issue. There's the are they selling the real thing issue. And I've had, you know, recently a client uh, asked me, can I just get it myself? And I said, look, you are obviously in charge of your own life. You can do whatever you want. But thyroid is really something that I would strongly recommend getting from a doctor. So that then you can tell any other medical professional you come across that you have a prescription of it. If something terrible were to happen, like you're in hospital, or you're in jail or something, you would still be able to take it which you wouldn't be able to if uh, you didn't have that prescription from a real doctor. And it's something you do not want to go cold turkey on. So thyroid, TRT injections, like those would be things I would really strongly recommend that you have a doctor's prescription, even more than I would strongly recommend that in general. Uh, next question, so confusing. This sounds like a lose-lose situation. Fatty acids block body's ability to produce energy via glucose properly, which leads to stress hormones that slow down fat burning. So then how the heck can anyone ever lose weight? Yeah, that's the um, conundrum of the repeat system that the free fat, when you go to lipolysis, which is breaking down fat in the tissues to... Um, uh, liberate them to be used as energy. The problem is the more that your body goes into a fat burning rather than a glucose burning, the less carbon dioxide is created as a byproduct and the more oxygen that is needed as a part of that process of beta oxidation. And so it's, uh, and it, there is some evidence that it is uh, blocking that glucose metabolism which leads to insulin resistance which is more and more considered as a root cause for all kinds of metabolic diseases so it is a tricky one 
I would say, and so this is from the rapey system perspective. Uh, I have not seen a good answer to this. Um, I've seen a lot of critics of that system say that, you know, some of the people who promote it are overweight. I would say losing weight really isn't the focus of that system, to be fair. The focus of that system is to have energy and to feel great uh, that, and to lower stress. I would say that would be the simple way of putting it. Um, but to answer your question, my understanding is their focus is not on burning fat, but on speeding up the metabolism. So they would say, rather than getting someone with a weak, slow metabolism and then liberating fat that then weakens and slows down their metabolism even more, and it's not all fat that necessarily does it, it's the polyunsaturated fats that do it, but everyone has those in storage, so unfortunately it amounts to the same thing. Um, so rather than focusing on doing that, like almost everyone does, whether that's by fasting, having a low-fat diet, uh, exercising, all of uh, reducing calories, all of those things will increase lipolysis, which will then release those free fatty acids into the bloodstream. So rather than doing all of that, focus on doing all the stuff that Ray P talks about, that we've talked about, that speed up your metabolism, optimize your metabolism first. Then when you do things that increase lipolysis, you will be, okay, slowing down the metabolism again, but it'll be going from optimal or maybe even slightly above optimal to a bit below optimal rather than going from already bad to terrible which is what happens to most people when they when they do dieting um so it's always gonna have that that's my understanding if someone has a more sophisticated understanding of ray pete's perspective and they think i've got that wrong then please educate me but that's my understanding of it Great, really good. Um, can chronic infections lead to immunosuppression as well as inflammation? I have slightly raised ASO uh, titer, titer, T I T E R, and um, WBCs and neutrophils are below the reference range. Mm -hmm. In terms of those white blood cell lab ranges, uh, we should be talking about that in an episode that should have been released by now with Dr. Miriam, where we talk about the white blood cell lab markers. Uh, to answer the question, yes. Um, I'm glad they asked that. That's a good clarifying question. I didn't focus on it in that episode because that episode was about chronic infections um, and, you know, how to deal with infections specifically. But absolutely, and it can do both. So it can both make you uh, too weak to deal with infections and simultaneously overreacting to things that should be harmless, like, you know, allergens. So, yeah, it can absolutely do that. And it can do both at once, which is particularly annoying. <laughs> Great. <laughs> both both weaken both weaken and overstimulate. It. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Um, next one. Thank you. Grant, have you looked at Kelsey Kenny's work on LYL for nicotinic acid? Uh yeah. Grant's never gonna see that comment, but I'll <laughs> reply to it. Yes, um I have. I'm very aware of it, and I discussed it with Dr. Smith in uh his episode, his interview that we did recently. Uh, next one. Could you please spell out the Russian antivirals that Owen mentioned he likes? Um, yeah, I think I did that in that comment. Uh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't include that. But uh, yeah, I think I did that in that comment. And they're all available on Cosmic Nootropic. So if you go to Cosmic Nootropic and uh, click on the immune section, you'll be able to make out what they are <laughs> by looking through their selection there. Uh, at rapid fuel, so it's quite quite perfect. Um, does it help with NAFLD? Uh, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Any context for that one? Okay. Um, I am going to guess that the cholestasis episode then, and I would say the answer is definitely yes. Doing all the things that I've recommended for cholestasis will absolutely help uh, help for known alcoholic fatty liver disease. I'd say non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is really a progression of cholestasis where the emphasis is on the cholesterol building up specifically um, as opposed to uh, say the you know calcium stones or something which is more like a gallstone or liver stone issue uh, but yeah follow all the advice that we give on cholestasis and it will help with that too. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today 
and in the future. I've found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. Uh, when I was young and dumb, I had experienced experimented with GHB as a replacement for alcohol. One thing I definitely noticed is that under its influence, it became impossible to orgasm. I always wondered what mechanisms were at play, especially considering it makes the brain go into full glutamate bath. Any ideas? Uh, it does, but I look this up. GHB is also a um, heavy GABA agonist as well which is why it has the sedative effect. So my understanding, and I'm not an expert on GHB, I say I'm more of an expert on most drugs anyway than GHB, uh, but my understanding is because it's such a heavy GABA agonist, uh, it, it does require a certain amount of excitation to, uh, to orgasm. So the, yeah, the glutamate overstimulation, I know what you mean, but I believe that's temporary. And then the GABA agonism is much more, so, yeah, but but it's more long lasting. So the um, there's like a temporary high from the GHP, and then there's quite a strong sedative effect. I think that's my understanding of it. So I think it's the strong sedative effect that would uh, prevent you from orgasming because orgasm requires uh, quite a high level of adrenal activation, and so if you have enough GABA, uh, it will prevent that from happening. Next, here we go. Hey, Ellen, I started taking tyrosine 1.6 grams plus choline in the AM along with breakfast. I eat 200 grams of protein during the day, nothing dairy-based. It's working wonderfully, feel great all day. However, I also started taking an EAA that's heavy in BCAAs and sometimes later on in the day with cardio, I've also started to have sleep disruption around 2 to 3 AM. Which of these is more likely to contribute to sleep issues in your estimation? Yeah, so I'm not sure if it's any of them, um, but doing workouts late, I'm not sure how late you're doing them. But say if you're doing eight, if you try, say you're doing them eight p.m. and then trying to get to sleep at ten p.m., that could potentially even be the issue. Um, For the waking up at between two and three. Yeah, yeah, it's quite stimulating, and then it, you know once you're stimulated, it you might be exhausted enough to fall asleep, but not relaxed enough to stay asleep. So that's uh, potentially an issue. Um, I wouldn't blame the tyrosine if you're, that's not that much and you're having it very early in the day. I wouldn't blame the choline, um, the BCAAs. Yeah. I mean, no, I, I, I would say, yeah, the exercise at, and also 200 grams of protein. That is quite a lot depending on your size. Um, you know, some people say, you know, a gram per pound or whatever, uh, and it depends. Uh, you know, I just talked about this on the episode of Dr. Miriam recently in terms of kidney function. If your kidneys are in an optimal state, then they should be just fine with that. But if your kidneys are not in an optimal state, then they may be struggling with that much protein turnover, both in terms of dietary and the fact that you're breaking the muscles down with the exercise. So, yeah, and this person's also mentioned specifically with cardio, not saying anything about resistance training to build the muscle. I think if you're having that much protein and building muscle, you're replenishing more, then that should be okay. But if it's purely just cardio, which is breaking down, yeah. maybe. Yeah, fair point as well. Yeah, so so I would maybe do a kidney function test and make sure that that EGFR rating is above uh, above 90 or above 100. If it is low, it may just be because you're having so much protein. It may not be something to worry about, but it may be something to look into. I know this is supposed to be rapid fire and we have done an episode on sleep, but that dis the sleep disruption between 2 and 3 a.m. is very, very, very common. What else potentially could that be? Uh, blood sugar imbalance more than anything. Um, 
And so, but yeah, this person's obviously having a large amount of protein like later in the day, presumably after exercise. So I, I'm assuming they're having a meal not long before falling asleep. If they're having a lot of protein in there, I would struggle to think that they're having a blood sugar crash if they're having a fairly high protein meal, uh, even though that is the most common reason for waking up at that time. So... Mind you, if you're having a lot of BCAAs, then if you're having a lot of, yeah, what kind of carbs are you having with that? You know, a lot of people are having like glucose or maltodextrin or something like that. That might be causing a blood sugar spike that then is leading to a crash that then you're experiencing at two in the morning that's waking you up. So really great point, Chrissy. Look at the carbs that you're having. If you're having some really glyce high glycemic carbs after exercising or even before exercising, that may be it. And I, I and sorry, yeah, I would just consider if you're having EAA with BCAA, that is a lot of methionine and a lot of um, tryptophan. And so I would add in a bunch of glycine, both for kind of complicated reasons of glutathione building and stuff like that. And also just simply because it is calming uh, and it also supports balanced blood sugar. So I would go for a good amount of glycine on top of that, maybe instead of some of that protein, instead of, <laughs> instead of on top of the protein as you're already having so much. <laughs> Beautiful. We're getting close to the end. Here we go. Would cooking not destroy the thyroid hormones from animal-based soups? Uh, no, in the same way that, you know, a pH of one stomach acid doesn't seem to destroy it. It seems to work just fine to consume it orally. I'm not quite sure why that is, but for whatever reason, tyrosine bound to free iodine molecules or four iodine molecules seems to be extremely uh, robust and difficult to break down with either heat or acid. Wonderful. And um, what is your experience with Tudka? Is it also better to accompany that with uh, HCL acid? Tudka is excellent, uh, in my opinion, and I recommend it in the cholestasis episode. Uh, beta and HCL, I would be more cautious about. I see people saying with Tudka, oh, you should be careful and cycle it on and off. And I'm not saying you should have too much, but like one to one and a half grams seems to be perfectly safe. I've seen studies where uh, certainly in animal models where they're having 10 times as much of that by equivalent body weight, and that's totally fine. I haven't seen any research that indicates actually cycling it off is necessary at all, but whatever, if you are aware of that, let, let me know. So Tudka is considered pretty safe. Betaine HCL, on the other hand, which is a stomach acid substitute, can be dangerous. If you already have an excessive amount of stomach acid or if you already have a worn down stomach lining, like a pre-ulcer or even an ulcer, then betaine HCL will make it worse and could even lead to serious life-threatening issues like a bleeding ulcer. So um, I would only have betaine HCL if you actually need it. And that's something that a functional medicine doctor or someone like that can guide you through. But make sure you actually need HCL before you have it. So should you have it with Tudka? No, unless you need it. <laughs> it's really a separate thing. Tudka is to support cholestasis and is relatively harmless. Beta and HDL is to support a lack of stomach acid and is very helpful if you have a lack of stomach acid, but it's also very dangerous if you have an excess of stomach acid. So be careful with it. I want to ask you, because um, when I was uh, listening back to the Garrett Smith episode, he talks about Tutka and he said, you know, he says something that's a little bit different than I know what we have discussed. So I wanted to ask you about that on his thoughts versus, you know, what you know about it too. Remind me what he says about it. So he's saying that because it's a secondary bile acid, it's actually slowing down the detoxification process. That is why people do feel better, but it's actually slowing down the process instead of... Because it's uh, uh, contributing to cholestasis. That is not my understanding from the research, and it's also not my experience. So I have stroke had this highly unusual issue called uh, sphincter of oddy dysfunction, um, where not only does the bile not move properly, but it actually this juncture between the gallbladder and the, the duodenum, it gets stuck. So it's like a very serious, painful issue. And one of the things that's recommended for that is Tudka. And now, of course, as you said, he would just say that it's because it's stopping the production of bile that that problem is going away. But that is not my experience. I can very easily tell if bile is flowing or not. When bile is flowing, I am way less constipated. When bile is flowing, I'm much more hungry. When bile is flowing, I digest food a lot better. Um, and so I can tell when bile is flowing and when bile is not flowing. When I take Tudka, bile tends to flow uh, better and quicker and more easier. So 
yeah, both in terms of theory and experience, uh, I don't agree with that. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Yeah. And again, you know, everybody do your research, get out there and experiment and, and find what, yeah, exactly what your truth is for you. So this is our final question. Oh, and here we go. Is L-tyrosine something that can be tried without a doctor's assistance? Is that typically a risky thing? L-tyrosine is an amino acid that's naturally found in most protein food. So yeah, I would consider it to be uh, very safe. Obviously, when you have a, an isolated amino acid in a free form, it you know is absorbed a lot more rapidly. The reason for the caution is because it's the building block of dopamine and adrenaline, and noradrenaline, and so yes, it can have a stimulating effect on people. Uh, I would say it has a significantly less stimulating effect though than things that are commonly used as if they're no big deal, like coffee or tea or energy drinks. Um, obviously, depending to some degree on doses, but actually not really. I mean. You have to be fairly sensitive before even any amount of tyrosine is really going to have a, a you know an excessive impact on you. It's uh, yeah, it's it's not a big deal. It's it's a natural part of food. So especially and now just to clarify that, especially if you include it in food, I tend to not have it on its own. Um, I have it with food. If you have it on its own, it is better absorbed, but it is more imbalanced again. So I guess I'll clarify and quantify that and say, so long as you have it with food like I do, I really would treat it as a food rather than as a medicine that you need supervision for. Wonderful. And just a couple more comments just that uh, people have shared. Life-changing information. Thanks for this interview, and I look forward to more on this subject. I love these episodes. Most of these I've heard already as I was battling with my own health issues. But it's such a good summary. It really helps to connect the dots heard that yeah and finally amazing conversation really helpful i'm so happy whenever i find another gold mine of knowledge and ideas that really question and challenge my beliefs your channel seems to be one of those gold mines and i'm now listening to all your other videos keep up the great work wow so yeah i mean nice. I, I, I appreciate all those positive comments but that last one really sounds like our ideal listener so <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much and uh, keep uh, keep watching and yeah please uh share it with people who you think would appreciate it Review us on whatever platform you listen to it on or watch it on. Uh, like it, comment it. So far, the algorithms of these various platforms have been good-ish to us. Nothing has gone viral or anything, but they are kind of, they're not blacklisting us or whatever. They are putting our content in front of people. The more you do all that stuff, the more you subscribe and rate it and share it and all the rest, the more likely those platforms are to recommend it to other people. Um, and the more that it's recommended to other people, the more people watch, the longer we'll be able to do this because we can't keep doing it forever uh, as a uh, loss-making <laughs> endeavor. So I'm not asking you for any money, but please do help us share it and please do help us um, by telling the different platforms that this is something that you like so that, that they in turn share it with more people. Absolutely. Your contributions matter and they make a difference. So please, please, please do that. Well, Ellen, this has been absolutely wonderful. It's lovely to hear from our listeners and I'd love to do another one of these again. So, uh, you know, if you guys want your questions uh, posted here, please put them in the comments. We'll go through them and we'll uh, be doing another one of these in the future. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Sorry, just to add, please give us some feedback on this because I was in two minds about doing this. Uh, so I'm not sure if we'll do another one. So if you like it, please tell us uh, and then we will. Absolutely. And again, thank you all for joining us. We do this for you and we love to show up for you. So please make sure that you do do as Ellen said, leave us a review, hit the like and subscribe button or the bell icon and so that you don't miss any of the episodes. And we look forward to seeing you again. Take care. See you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next.